Ready? Okay. Let's go. Okay. So this is the white room. We are back. And uh, with me is uh, Mariah Nee from Amsterdam. Are you there? Hi, I'm here. How are you? Mariah is a tap dancer and a performer. And uh, what would you say? What else? Oh, <laughs> don't get me started. She was a lawyer. <laughs> I was a lawyer. Some time yeah. ago. Actually, I'm, I'm not convinced that that it's a good thing to say i am this i, I do all this oh we are starting to get I very do the tap dancing good you're doing tap <laughs> yeah. dance I also um, cooking cooking great Indeed. myself i am uh, simon this is simon speaking bronikowski from schwerte germany a small town near dortmund and also near cologne uh, i'm actor and musician Uh, working at Studio 7 Theater. And uh, this is our little podcast project called The White Room, Conversations on Theater. Um, maybe it's also good to remember why we started it. Um, mm. This podcast was uh, an idea that was born actually like one year ago by me. And uh, the whole reasoning you can also hear in the first episode where we spoke uh, at length about what we are going to speak about and why and what is maybe also difficult about it. But uh, so I the idea popped up in my mind uh, about one year ago. And uh, before this corona crisis, uh, I already spoke with Mariah and uh, then suddenly uh, everything changed and uh, it became urgent as ever to uh, do it. And yeah, what what are we doing here? We are speaking about theater and everything what it can what is part of theater we're speaking about performance about performing and um, we discovered that this is a podcast from the perspective of the performer so we are curious about we are like childishly curious about everything what is concerning performance um, this is not really about um, what is up, what is the mo how do you say what is modern today? This is not about what should performances look like today. No, what is the uh, zeitgeist of the performances that should be uh, there today? It's more like um, it's uh, curiosity and the, the love of the strange details and paradoxes which live inside of this strange art which is theater performance live performance uh, yeah and also what happens with the live performance when we are in this strange circumstances in the digital world in the digital space no what do you say mariah was that right <laughs> oh sorry i wasn't listening <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, <laughs> this is Simon uh, speaking, and I am living near Cologne, as I said. And uh, I'm very happy to say hello to a guest today. She was being silent, modestly silent, in <laughs> one of the uh, corners of the room. But now you can come out, Marta. Hello, Marta. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi, Simon. Hi, Mariah. Uh, Ma hey, Marta. Uh, Mariah, maybe you can uh, now introduce her a little bit because, of course, we know each other. We met each other uh, some time ago. I mean, some some weeks ago. And I know that you're an opera singer, and that yeah. we are going to speak today about a lot of things concerning the voice and the yeah. singing. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Maybe you How can. To introduce maybe you Marta. can. Well, yeah. Uh, I will gladly do that, but uh, I have to say I haven't known Marta so long. But but I feel that uh, since since February, to be precise, in the north. Now I feel like a stranger in the room. <laughs> yes, you are <laughs> such a strange creature, Marta. <laughs> This was a, immediately apparent when I, when we met, which was in the in the first. Meeting of the Parliament of Practices, which uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, is this uh, meeting platform for people with a practice, and then 
we start with people with a theatrical practice or performative practice. So Marta was there, and uh, and as is, I think her one of her most endearing traits is she when when something is appealing or interesting, you know, there's no way that you can hold Marta back. I think so. She <laughs> jumped into this idea of the parliament and then embraced it and brought it online during the corona crisis and uh, and I'm just extremely happy to get to have gotten to know you and uh, and start working together um so without further ado here's Marta opera singer and much 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 more than that I think yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, when when I met you guys in the parliament, it was like finding some finding something that I was looking for for a long time, mm. to connecting practice and uh, reflection on the practice. Um, yeah, and that has to do with the path that I am on as a as a performer, as as a human being as well. Thanks for being here, and it's um, for me it's very intriguing because. Um, I'm, I love, uh, singing and I love speaking about singing and hearing about singing. So um, maybe because I'm th maybe the one who knows you less, I can also ask you, who are you? Where do you live? What do you do <laughs> at the moment? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I come from Poland originally, from Poznań, but I live in Germany, in Cologne. It's been eight years now. I've also lived in the United States before, and that's where I studied, and that's where I started working as an opera singer. And yeah, opera singing and concert singing is my main profession. Uh, but I'm also currently really enthusiastic about developing other activities around singing or which has roots in singing. And that's teaching and teaching not only singing, but also helping other people to release their voices, to free their voices, to learn to speak in a more present and confident way. This what what you are uh, uh, mm -hmm. saying right now, Marta, it, it yeah. really connects also to this vision of the practice, no? that the practice Absolutely. have this, oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, so teaching would be one of these activities that I am really embracing right now and especially in the Corona times but also trying to discover projects around singing, uh, around the practice of using the voice in an athletic way, like we opera singers do, and reflect on that, reflect on that kind of communication as well. And the whole phenomenon of, of um, opera theater and what does it do to the society. Yeah, so I'm kind yeah. of like an opera singer plus. <laughs> <laughs> opera yeah, singer plus, that sounds very good. I have to an say athletic, that... An athletic voice, though. Yeah, we should come to that. We should yeah. come, definitely That's come to that. interesting, yeah. I remember, remember I would, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I want to... I'm really curious because I don't know anything about opera. And I, I want to uh, also hear a little bit about this world of the opera because I have some questions for that. But I want to start, I would like to mm -hmm. uh, start a little bit differently. When we talked before, I reveal now to the listeners, we had some preliminary uh, previous contact uh, <laughs> trying to establish our technique, which is sometimes a little bit difficult for me and for everybody. Yeah. But uh, good, we spoke a little bit before and Marta, you said, you said because I said to you, okay, I will maybe prepare and I, I would like to ask you how you began. And you said to me, um, I hate this. Everybody in every interview, all <laughs> the artists, they are saying how they started and it's so boring how to hear everybody <laughs> how he started, all these artists. No? And you're totally right, of course, it's, it's, it's terrible. But uh, I, nevertheless, I would like to provoke you a little bit and maybe ask differ differently because it's for me, mm -hmm. it, for me, it was actually always important to hear what, uh, what is the driving, if you can, if one wants to say it or to speak about it or to communicate it, what is the maybe some driving, driving force of why somebody is doing what he or she is doing. And so I like to ask, what is your heart of the beginning? 
for you with yeah, the, well, with that's, the that's, theater yeah. or maybe with the opera? Is it even the same or is it, I don't know. What is your first contact with the performance and where did it start for you? And then you can leave out all the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 well, the way you phrase this question now, I like this question. I'll be happy to answer that because in fact, yeah, uh, my passion for singing might be coming from a completely different place than my passion for opera theater. Um, and I feel like the passion for singing itself, it's the one that is much more important. And that's the one uh, around which I am building now my other activities. So that's, that's really uh, thrilling for a thrilling process for me. Uh, I don't come from a musical family. My mom could play the piano a little bit. Uh, but my father is rather not musical at all. But both my grandparents were. So when I was a child, I used to go to the church with my grandmother Felicia and sing with them, with her for a very long time, all the Polish Christmas carols, all the Polish Eastern uh, songs that, that, you know, that you sing in a church around Eastern and not just two or three verses, but like 10 <laughs> or 12. <laughs> and some of them I really know by heart till today. And some of them had really fantastic melodies and poetry because it's very often old archaic Polish language. Mm. Um, so these were really, really important moments for me, this creating connection with my grandmother through singing. And then with the grandparents from my mom's side, Edward and Wanda, they were scouts. They were then also very active in a Polish resistance movement over the Second uh, World War. And they have their own tradition of songs that you sing as scouts in Poland, which are a little <laughs> bit, uh, <laughs> maybe not about revolution, but about resistance, about being patriotic. Mm. They're also very, you know, like... Um, archaic in the language you sing them with the guitar very often uh and this is what i also remember very strongly singing with um my my grandparents from my mom's side um so i think these are like the, the most important memories for me where i got uh, interested in in expressing myself with singing and then i was just looking for any possible um, choir where I could sing. So I joined the church choir. I joined the school choir. Eventually, I joined a semi-professional choir in Poznań where I lived. Then I started um, sing, taking singing lessons. And then I ended up at the um, Academy of Music, now the University of Music in Warsaw. Um, but the times that I remember at the most fun and is the most valuable are actually this, you know, free singing with grandmothers, everything mm. that has to do with education and this classical education in classical music has a completely different baggage on it. It's more, you know, about perfectioning, achieving, getting to the next place, satisfying the jury. Uh, during your exam and it has a completely different energy so uh, I like to connect myself actually to this little Marta singing with their grandparents when I stay on stage in fact and, and sing for the people oh, beautiful. Um, yeah and in terms of the opera uh, well Apparently, I, I used to be a very performative child from the beginning because I, uh, the story is that I used to jump on a table and, and do a little show about the drei uh, Schweinchen. How do you say it? Three, three little swines. Three pigs. <laughs> piggies. Yeah, three, three piggies. pigs. Exactly. Three little piggies. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my show when I was little. But then I really remember the first thing that I saw in a the theater was uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Mm. It was the musical. Yeah. And uh -huh. I also had the cassette, uh, the tape. Um, at home and I still remember all the songs you know the tradition 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 <laughs> <laughs> and um, if I were a rich man all these tunes so I think that was the first time where I got also hooked uh, by the uh, musical theater mm. Mm. yeah 
Yeah. Wow. So now, of course, we have that, to, there's a lot of things. Yeah, Mariah, jump in. Yeah, well, I just do want to lift out this uh, this very nice image of, of someone singing this very perfectionist and high-level technical opera. But what's going on inside is a little girl singing with grandma. <laughs> and I think that image will... Uh, will stay with me because it's so uh it's it's really putting the two polarities of being of what it means to do art right you have to have this technical but then also you have to connect back to your to the heart and to what it means and rise this will help you to rise out of the technical harness that you have built or technical structure yes so thank absolutely you for that image. and yeah yeah, and you know the thing is, and that's why am I? Uh, that's why I am so fascinated with the human voice, is that in terms of anatomy, there's mm. actually not so much difference between singing with the grandma and singing on opera stage. You are just still basically working your vocal cords and your throat muscles together with your diaphragm and the whole breathing system. It's just that, you know, once you train as an opera singer, you're you're more aware of how you use mm -hmm. it and you use also the resonating cavities. But there is right. also this element of spontaneity and not being to actually co able to control a lot of stuff because it goes automatically. Like when we speak, you know, we don't make a decision. Okay, now my vocal cords <laughs> are going together and now I'm pumping the air for the diaphragm and here we go. It's automatic. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's why it's so fascinating, you know, that on on, a, on some very simple level, it's actually still kind of the same activity. But don't I, you think that many times this little girl is or 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 boy is is lost somehow is kind of uh, uh, banished? Absolutely. You you mean when when we reach this professional level? Mm -hmm. uh, that that's yes. That we lose connection to this to this natural to the spontaneous way of of using our voice as a mean of expression. Absolutely. Also, the 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 very big difference is that the little girl or the little boy, they sing with whatever comes out of their throat. They do not judge mm -hmm. themselves for no. whether the sound was nice or not. Yeah. In fact, you know, they might know that the sound is hurting their. Parents, or they are being annoying, <laughs> but they still will continue exactly. because they have this freedom and of expression. They enjoy that, right? They even enjoy Absolutely. this power of. Uh, I mean, seriously, yes. I, I sometimes think uh, when I see little kids, but really small kids, like either babies or toddlers, and when they are screaming or crying, the amount of volume that comes out of this little thing. Is, yeah, is crazy, and I think, oh my God, when is the last time that I actually allowed myself <laughs> this this mm -hmm. abandon? And it can't be so that I'm now so much bigger, but the 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 volume I can produce is actually is is way less. It's a kind of a mystery yeah. to me, actually. Absolutely. Well, this is this is one of the main points while teaching singing is that we already knew how to be loud when we were hmm. babies, and we knew how to use the voice for a long time without getting tired, right? The babies right. never get hoarse from, no, uh, from they crying. They don't. Hmm. To exactly. the sadness of their parents, you'll see, Simone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. But but that's the, that's why learning so, how to yeah. sing an opera is actually, you have to be able to recreate some activities that you already were doing just on a completely, you know, unconscious uh, level and in an unconscious way as a baby. But wow. that's why I'm saying that it's actually the same muscle coordination that the babies are using. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, I wanted to... Ask something, but what was it? 
What? Well, what I can it? then just say something. Yeah. If you can just hold the thought yeah. for a yeah, second, yeah, yeah. because I think, and this is also the area that I'm really looking forward to explore more now. I ask mm. myself this question: Okay, so what happens that we actually lose this ability to be so effective? and efficient in the way we are using our ah, voices as yes. children. Yes. And I think what happens is that we learn to speak and we learned that with producing words and communicating uh, through sound, there comes consequences because you might be saying something that your mommy doesn't like, for example, mm -hmm. Or you have to admit doing something that you know your mommy wouldn't like. So there comes this whole um, range of emotions and consequences that are then connected to the voice. And that is uh, that I think stop us from being completely free in our expression, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why people, uh, children, when they are around school age, some of them start speaking very soft because they're, for example, shy, because they're afraid of being laughed at, um, because they don't know the answer for the to the questions, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is where we kind of uh, put these obstacles or the society does. Um, so it's so interesting then to, when I work with myself and with my own voice or when I work with my students to kind of, um, I would say, uh, people say in German, ausräumen. So like to get rid of all these elements um, that are on the way of our vocal freedom. That's a very right. nice, uh, interesting thought that we will come back also, I think, when we are going to speak again about acting and acting training, because it reminds me of, of the what uh, Grotowski called the via negativa, uh, which uh -huh. which is uh, the way of not... Um, uh, it's, it seems first like a philosophical thought, but it also has real consequences in working. So you don't you don't work to build up a character or to build up, to learn... Um, how to be like an evil person on stage, but you learn how to you unlearn what you are your social uh, tensions that you were learning through your life and which was t taught to you, and you learn how to 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 get rid of of unnecessary tensions, unnecessary stops of energy that prevent that. Any energy, be it vocal or physical or whatever, or ops, or, or psychic, you know, or psychological, mm -hmm. maybe that it comes through you. And also Orson Welles, the famous uh, director, speaks about acting like this. He says that um, acting is uh, what you take away from yourself. What you take away, you you are some person, and you take away your good side, and then there is your evil side. No, hmm. in every person mm -hmm. there is a saint and a whore, and uh, absolutely. And uh, so, and this this uh, this um, this approach, this approach, this negative approach yeah. of of the sculptor. What we were also talking last time with Mario about uh, Michelangelo sculpting no he is revealing something inside of the sculpture he's yeah. taking away and this was also what grotowski was talking about in the in the training for the training of the actor to take away that that which is impeding the yes. uh, the um the 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 impulse to come through whatever impulse now means okay um, I, I really oh sorry yeah yeah so and i yeah i would like to really add that this the voice is a very 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 strange animal let's say inside of our <laughs> of our our, our our tool inside of our of our organism because um I remember also I I worked a lot I mean I'm not a I'm not an, a trained opera singer I'm not an opera singer at all <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I, I I just sing um but I also uh, can teach or I could teach and I started to teach people to to just sing yeah and I started to very early in my uh, working with as an actor and with actors, with colleagues, I started uh, singing with other people. So as I, I, I can provoke other people to sing with me. And, awesome. And, um, and I know, therefore, what is going on with them. And you can see a lot how it is difficult for some people to open the voice. And there is some kind of a limitation, which is... Um, 
which is can be so strong that after surpassing that people start to cry that that, that happened to me once in a, in a workshop which i gave and I, i was working with singing also with them with the people and um of course and and one of the women she started to cry after some time because we were re now we were repeating repeating the song repeating the song trying to open up open up and then what she told me afterwards was that she was hearing her mother or her father i don't remember in her childhood saying to her you can't sing stop singing no mm -hmm. don't do it uh, it sounds ugly or whatever no oh, wow. what we all that's harsh but <laughs> But more yeah, or yeah, that's not the first time I'm hearing a story yeah, like more this. Or less, a lot I of mean, people, especially maybe yeah. here in Germany. I don't know what you yeah. say about that matter, but <laughs> I feel, especially <laughs> here in this in this country, uh, I feel that there's a lot of stories like that that people um, that they, they they heard other people say to them or their parents mm -hmm. or what authorities say to them, now you cannot sing, no. And this is uh, then for some who afterwards want to maybe express themselves or want to do something, it's like a real limitation. And it's like Absolutely. a physical block. <laughs> and you know, what's the interesting thing is that it's um, only this cultural perspective that people use to decide who can sing and who cannot. And mm -hmm. people who cannot sing are the ones that are not able to, you know, repeat the melody Uh, exactly, or the ones that and they sing in a group and everyone is singing the same melody. They, you know, they they start singing different, uh, start singing false notes. Uh, but to me, and I, I have uh, students like this who who are not able to repeat the sound, or sometimes they do, sometimes they can. It's kind of like it's on and off. But to me, it's not that they cannot sing. <laughs> they just have, you know, their own sense of um, mm. of tonality. And the, the thing is to open up the voice and to make people um, friends with their own voices. You have to absolutely get rid of this perspective of what's wrong and what's right and just accept what is and just accept it as the way this person is expressing herself or himself by singing. And there are people, and I'm sure, um, I don't know if you guys like go or used to go to church. I, you know, grew up in Catholic Poland. So that was a big a part of my experience. And you always have these people in a church who sing wrong, who sing these false mm -hmm. notes. And sometimes they're very loud, but they don't care. And I think there's actually something really powerful in that. Just join the crowd and sing and don't care whether it's right or wrong. I think there's something powerful in that. Yes, definitely. Also, in a, uh, I had this uh, thought already earlier when you spoke about expressing, uh, you know, and then the socialization that happens. Uh, is it? It has a democratic uh, uh, aspect to it. You know, democracy mm -hmm. in a way is about using your voice and being heard, and all voices kind of uh, uh, talking together. Exactly. And, um, yeah. If there is a very strict norm on who is allowed to vocalize mm -hmm. and how, and then a very strict, it, it says also something about our vision on uh, acceptability, what is normal, when are you allowed to be present, mm -hmm. you know, to be a citizen, and how do we deal with um, the other, the different, the one also with singing, you could think about all these other cultures and traditions of vocalizing. That have nothing to mm -hmm. do with being uh, in tune. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. in tune. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then comes this this really interesting phenomenon that I am I, I myself asking, uh, how is it possible? I also took part in some uh, theater workshops when at the end we sang together just like one tune, you know, like ah. Uh, And we actually, all of us, we must have been around 30 people. We were very, very clean. I mean, we were all singing the same note. Mm -hmm. And it took a while, but our coach uh, or our director was saying, just, you know, keep focusing on the sound and keep focusing on matching the sound that others are uh, singing. 
And so after, I don't know, one or two minutes, we have this really beautiful one sound unisono. So mm. it's also possible. It just takes some kind of um, focus opening. and concentration yeah. and opening. And also, I think, starting to listening through your body rather yeah. than through your mind who is telling you, oh, you're singing the wrong note. Oh, my God, yeah. everyone is hearing yeah. you. You should just shut up. Just yourself. like, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a, you kind of yeah. like the, tune outside. Mm-hmm. What I was uh, when I was giving the rhythm workshop uh, in the in the Get Active Online, the, mm-hmm. the, I would, because it it works very much the same way with keeping rhythm. You know that people tell me a lot. I don't have a sense of rhythm. I can't do all that. Mm-hmm. And then we work on walking and on listening to the footsteps and listening to the body creating this pattern or this pulse and then slowly start to discover through the body and through like opening up basically listening with the body to the others Mm -hmm. that actually yeah it's very natural also to um to meld together into a pulse and then start to feel very comfortable in there yeah yeah, it is natural. Mm-hmm. It is also it is natural to to use the voice. It is natural to cry, to scream, to shout, no? To to to, to do something with the voice. And um, and what is interesting in terms of maybe being in tune or out of tune? That my experience is that is there is hardly a person that can be out of tune because it's it's mm-hmm. actually difficult to be out of tune. It mm. is uh, if you, as uh, at least if you're uh, like a group of people, if you sing together one note, let's maybe say un- unisono, one note, mm-hmm. then it is really hard for somebody to be really out of tune. What happens normally is that they get in some kind of natural interval, like they exactly. sing, they sing the yeah. fifth, fifth, maybe. No, exactly. normally the exactly. fifth. Yeah, normally yeah. the fifth, and they and it's so natural that they don't hear. It's different. Mm-hmm. exactly so. Very it is true. not a question yeah. of of your vocal cords or of being yeah. able to sing. It's just it's just uh, being used to hearing it. Act actually, no, being used to exa- hearing what is the same note and what is a different note and what is an mm-hmm. octave and what is a afterwards. Mm-hmm. No, just getting the, familiar. Getting familiar with these. And then yeah, it's it starts, an architecture, yeah. yeah, it's with this architecture, which of now, of course, it starts getting culturally um, made. No, so now here you get familiar with the with the fifth and with the octave and with the twelve tones, semitones, mm. or with eight normally in the. Oh my God! In between, you know, Simon. Yeah, I just re- recently uh, heard that in the Ottoman music, mm-hmm. they had twelve intervals between two notes yeah yeah i don't yeah, know how yeah. many they are but there is a lot 12 ah okay. 12 mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> between and yeah mm-hmm. 12 yeah there's a, like a one it's like a yes we have one and they have 12 it's like a, <laughs> it's, it's like the enormous space inside of the atom no between the electrons absolutely <laughs> there's Unlimited. a lot of space still too <laughs> there's a lot of but the beautiful thing i mean you mentioned already intervals and maybe we we get a bit technical here but but these 12 uh, divisions within one note, they would never be, you know, all 12 uh, one after the other, because that would just give some kind of strange glissando. Nobody would, that's mm-hmm. not a musical thing, but they were used to tune the intervals, to tune the different intervals and give them a color. Yeah. Because it's a very, I wow. think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. beautiful. Right? I mean, this should be another episode, which we cannot yes. really, we should prepare all the history of the, of the, you know, of the circle of the fifths and everything, how it, everything <laughs> built up. Because uh, as we know, our, our system of, of, of music, of, 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 yeah. of harmony is, of course, made up, totally made up. And, yeah, and uh, out of tune. And out of tune <laughs> in the natural <laughs> sense of the word, no? Yes. Uh, but this is a really other topic. What I maybe I would like to to um, because I was I was saying before I just sing, no? I don't sing in your way, let's say, no? And mm-hmm. I now I want to understand what is the difference actually. Because mm-hmm. I, I maybe I yes, I, I, I can say what is the difference. My voice is of course not so trained. But there is another difference too, maybe. 
um, what is are you con are you are you would you say that you sing bel canto? Uh, yeah, well, bel, bel canto, which means beautiful singing, yes. uh, it's the term that comes from Italy from uh, 19th century, actually a little bit earlier already, um, and this is the the moment when opera was it as at its height. Uh, and was super popular and also the composers mm. were writing extremely complicated parts for the singers so they could show this atle athletic approach uh, that I mentioned before um, in its full potential. Um, mm. And it has to do mostly with the way we connect the tones to each other. So they are like kind of It feels like you have a rubber uh, gam, gam, as it's how we call it, rubber string, and mm. uh, it's stretching and stretching and stretching, and the phrases and the notes within this rubber string are kind of like all on this one string. So you don't hear like, a, so it feels like the voice is extremely even, you know? You, you mean so this feeling is, this like... Is, This is what you That's, physically feel when you're singing it? No, in fact, I might listener? be feeling... This is the image of the listener. I, ah, inside okay, my right. I, my instrument, I might be feeling like there is hundreds of little movements going on and there uh -huh. is uh, lots of sensations, but I know that they all uh, add up for this, you know, beautifully smooth line. So it feels like mm. I'm just gliding on the orchestra. Mm. Um You you so, say orchestra, so it means that it's already has to have a connection to the other instruments, no? Yeah, I mean, it has to have a connection to the orchestra as a whole. Um, so you kind of feel like you're being accompanied by a one. Mm dragon monster. with many many heads monster with many many heads because you're not able to really hear you know every instrument separately you might hear the solos or the motifs that are being brought up but basically mm -hmm. it's like they are one partner for you um but just coming back to, to your first question what's the difference i would say that i have <laughs> i were dare to say that i have better muscle coordination than you mm -hmm. and that's why my singing is louder and that's why i'm able to stretch my voice over my like i would say normal scale and i'm able to hold high notes also for a long time and i'm able to sing low and be loud and 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 present And what really happens is that there is many, many, many muscles in the throat, in the larynx, and these muscles pull the vocal cords. One of them pull the vocal cords when the voice goes up, so the vocal cords stretch. Yes. And the other muscles are responsible for keeping the cords together. Mm. And the trick is that this muscle have to be working in a perfect coordination. So they also uh, create this kind of... a uh, suspension so the air is uh when it's coming from you know from our lungs and from our body it's um uh what's the word for that english word uh, there's a pressure air pressure that happens below the larynx yes um and then what makes our voice it is like, loud it, it is like a pillar of a pillar of of, of air no which is also yes. being in yeah. vibration absolutely is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great image. And what happens is also that the larynx, uh, so so imagine the larynx like a huge clock machine, you know, that there is like so many little muscles, so many little tribes working together, but also they hang in a throat in a position that creates space in there so that the throat itself is our first resonating space. Mm. And if the if there is enough resonating space, which means if the larynx in this is in this perfect position, Then from that space, the sound goes to the head and hits other resonating spaces, which are like in our uh, scalp, yeah, like behind uh, the, the nasal, the sinus, um, and, and these cavit cavities. And that makes the sound even louder. And then from our mouth, it goes on and it can, you know, travel <laughs> to the last road of the opera theater and cut through a really loud orchestra. Mm. So mm. that's the so process, basically. <laughs> You work. Is it? Uh, is this work different for men and women? 
Actually not, but physically, well, people say that men are naturally more connected to their like low breathing and diaphragm. Uh, well, it's actually hard to, for me to, to say if it's true or if it's just one of the many, many myths that are, <laughs> that are uh, you know, present in our uh, uh, in vocal pedagogic. But the process, no, the process is basically the same because, you know, everyone has larynx, everyone has vocal cords, everyone has diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you exp can you talk a little bit more about the resonance? How did you say resonance chambers? Mm -hmm. Resonance the cavities. Yeah, res cavities. The cavities. What is yeah. the role? How you, how how do you uh, do? You, how do you use them? How or how do you address them? Or is mm -hmm. there? Uh, yeah. How do you, you work know, with them? You know, this is now really interesting area because. Uh, there is many, many ways of uh, how people teach singing, and there is also many, mm. many traditions. And in fact, in the old tradition, so we're talking about the things that were written in like um, 17, 18, 19th centuries, they actually do not talk so much about this uh, resonating cavities. They just talked about, you know, uh, being present in your body and standing in a right position, which is relaxed yet hmm. active so you're not like you know completely without energy but you are open your chest is open your head head is a very important element so the the uh, relation between your head and your neck should give you a lot of flexibility there there shall not be stiffness in there because then it affects your uh, larynx and your jaw and everything um but most of the time they they used to say if the sound is produced from this uh, body that is relaxed yet active, and if the tongue is re is is not uh, having any uh, unnecessary tension, if the jaw is not having any necessary tension, and if you are singing clear vocals, which is now because we are talking the, this whole uh, singing school comes from Italy, the bel canto, and in Italian you have a, e, i, o, u. And if all the vowels are clean, so they are not like a, e, i, o, u, but they are really pure, then you should get a sound that is in fact loud. And so ah. this is the this is how I work, in fact. So I try to listen with my ears to my vowel quality. And I learn to kind of hear the many, many colors that appear in one sound and and manipulate it a little bit. If I hear that I'm missing a little bit of uh, glance, uh, what the word for glance, <laughs> Simon? Brilliance. <laughs> Brilliance. Shine. Brilliance. The shine. Yeah. That I Brilliance. kind of use my imagination to get a little bit more shine. Ah. Or if I'm missing the depth, that I am that I am asking myself, okay, can this sound re release somewhere in my body so I'm getting a little bit more depth? So that so I'm this this kind of singer that works a lot with the inner hearing and with the imagination. But they are singers, who, for example, who rely on the feelings on their face that for example they feel really? the, the sound vibrating around their nose and then they say mm -hmm. they feel the sound is focus and they they use the expression of the mask so the face will be mm -hmm. the mask and all the sound has to be focused in the mask and that's how they feel it's right so it's very mm -hmm. individual i tried this technique with mask and focus for some years and in my case it made my face <laughs> extremely tense yeah because i was tense, you know actually. <laughs> yeah, I was using the misconception of, you know, feeling the sun vibrating. I was trying to make it feel. So I was, you know, tensing all my muscles to basically I feel, feel anything. I feel, <laughs> I feel you, yeah. Ah. Exactly. <laughs> like that, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, it's, so there is many, many ways uh, of teaching that. But in fact, like at anatomically speaking, this cavities in your throat is the most important for the resonance. And then if everything is fine, uh, then the sound should just travel and hit naturally just hit the other cavities, you know? Hmm. The, uh, I, we were speak, you were speaking about colors of the voice. And what yeah. I find very interesting is that the physics behind that, because also it can be that two persons are out of tune of each other, or let's say the colors when you say colors of the voice, you mean over mm -hmm. uh, how do you harmonics, no overtones, yes. mm -hmm. harmonics, mm -hmm. and this is also, I think, it is 
the colors of the voice it is it depends on where your voice resonates if it's in the nose more or if it's more in the head or more in the chest no it's everything mm -hmm. it's this different color dark color light color uh, around one and there's also the difference between the vowels so the difference between mm -hmm. a a a e o u is mm -hmm. just overtones and it's the difference between the the sound of a wood instrument of a of a violin of a piano and of every instrument they can all play the same note no but the colors it sounds different because mm. of the overtones and of the colors Ki and kind of, of can i just interject there wait yeah Simone? yeah you can interject afterwards no just and just because uh? the with the instruments it's actually mm. fundamentally different that it's yeah. the how the note starts and how it ends that is the most big difference between the instruments yeah so it's not necessary. It's very difficult to tell the instruments apart if you just have the uh, the middle, you know, just the the sound pattern that you're speaking. Ah, of yeah, we could make an experiment yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah I can yeah, think that it's, uh, but uh, so um, the colors of the voice and the different um, um, harmonics, and this is also sometimes what makes people out of tune. No, the in uh, it's it's also the ability to adjust your own color to the color of the other person, so mm, to to, so to listen know, to the other, mm -hmm. uh, to to listen to the voice of the other and to merge to to connect. No. Yeah, I mean, I think we are talking about two different perspective because so mm. you think you are merging with someone else's color. But in fact, you're adjusting the um, the height of the pitch, mm -hmm. you know. So and so this is one of the things that you're using your kind of your hearing imagination to match someone's color, you know. So so you hear the someone else's voice might sound, I don't know, dark and gloomy to you mm -hmm. and you like it. So you're trying to match it. Yeah. But in order to match it you also uh, are 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 actually fixing your pitch yeah yeah and you sure. might be yeah 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 mm -hmm. i think yeah yeah this is interesting because maybe yeah this is why it's so important the imagination no to uh, to change let's say the physics of the sound because you would yes. if you would say well, you're too low or too high then you would start think about it and it's it's mm -hmm. kind of Yeah. Um, you cannot achieve it. Uh, maybe you will get tense or uh, anything because the voice is something also very sensitive, no? Yeah. And uh, so all these these ima these uh, in the intentionality and these imaginations uh, are, are used. Also, this these metaphors are used yeah. to be able to yeah to do something with the voice. Mm. Absolutely, Thank because you. in fact, there is no really other way, because unlike with playing the piano or the violin, you don't see the vocal cords, you don't see feel the, the diaphragm, actually, it doesn't have the nerves that you can sense in the same way that you sense the nerves in your finger, if you cut yourself or, you know, or you just feel that if you, whether your finger is moving or not. Uh, as far as I know, you you feel the muscles around the diaphragm and not the diaphragm itself, the muscles that are attached to the diaphragm. Mm. Uh, that's why you cannot consciously act on the diaphragm. Where if you could, then you could make yourself die just by, okay, now I stop breathing, that's it. I don't think yeah. <laughs> anyone has ever achieved that. And that's why the nature has, uh, in fact invented us in this miraculous way that some of our functions are um, unconscious, automatic. right? It, it's yeah. it, automatic. It just keeps going. Uh, but because of that, yes, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but because of that, you cannot tell the singer, okay, now push your diaphragm uh, 10 millimeters uh, lower in order to get, you know, better support or something. You cannot. But what you can say is, I feel like you might have been tensing the muscles in your um, uh, bodendecke. This is um, what's that uh, in your pelvic floor. Can you imagine that your pelvic floor 
is like a ball with water that is hanging between your hips and it's, um, you know, swinging and it's soft. And then people release some tension just based mm. on imagination and the mm. diaphragm can move more freely. Mm. So basically that's how most of a uh, voice teacher works, you know, just trying to find the images that will appeal to the singers and, and through this indirect um, yeah. method. Mm. But it's, it's very much connected, this uh, imaginative uh, teaching, also to the fact that the complexity of moving and changing your movement, it's impossible to describe in any other way. Like if, if yeah. I'm teaching tap dancing and I have to uh, teach someone how to make dynamics, mm -hmm. there's, there's no way that I can even grasp what the technicalities of that is i i have to like construct yeah mm -hmm. with you, the image yeah. of a ball and yeah. of uh you know yeah you reaching I think, under the floor yeah. i think you could but then it, you would start to sit down and to talk no <laughs> but you would I'm, not uh, but you would get into the head and the other person would be unable to do it no? this, absolutely it would have they have, would have no educational uh, uh yeah. effect at all even if if you could but i even i think you know it's like When an archer or, or or when you you play tennis, it's some or catch a ball. It's something that we and our bodies can do very instinctively. Mm -hmm. But the mechanics behind it, if you would describe them uh, with uh, with physics, mm -hmm. you have to study for I don't know how many years you know, to yeah. really understand also the turbulence of yeah. the air. Yeah, you will you <laughs> you will be able to describe them, and then you're a physicist. You will not play tennis. Exactly. <laughs> You yeah, can't the ball anymore. And yeah, then Serena cannot. Williams comes and you are dead <laughs> exactly. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so it is, uh, it is, uh, I also have a, um, uh, one of the only books that I have about breathing and voice. It's a very small book by two uh, Austrian men, uh, which is a very interesting, it's called Atem und Stimme, Breathing and Voice. Mm -hmm. And it's about speaking, no? Uh, um, uh, but also, and uh, there's a lot of things in that book. But one of the one of the main things that I found so interesting is that they they don't work with correction of anything. Like if you stutter, blah blah blah. blah not they, they don't work with something that you have to correct or what which mm -hmm. is right. To no, not with or to work with where do I put the pause or for the breathing or whatever. Mm -hmm. They work that you discover your intentionality, your your mm -hmm. that you can yeah, that you can be able to connect your intention, reconnect the intention with some kind of an impulse, and to get rid of the tension, so that these, so that actually the natural way of speaking, which is I want to say something, mm -hmm. and and according to what I want to say. My whole system adjusts how I breathe, how how long is my... No, no, I'm talking like I'm talking now, no? I want to say something, so there is a rhythm and there is a tone of the voice and an intensity. And if I, for instance, if there is a danger, yeah, and I have to warn somebody and I have to shout, hmm. ah, no, uh, go away, uh, whatever, no? I will, I will shout and um, uh, I will just use my voice. And, and so what Julia's famous example too. Yeah, and this this <laughs> this, this immediate so this um this how how could you say this um immediate response of response. the body to the task, you know? Yeah, the body yeah. responds to the task. So if you are uh honest with your body and you give it a real task, for example, you mm -hmm. are in a danger, then your body will scream. And your body will probably scream in the most effective way so it will not tire your throat. Yes, exactly. Uh, but if you have to fake scream, then your body will be like, mm, I don't know how to do that. So I have to yeah. fake it. And so yeah. after two minutes, you will be hoarse. Yeah. So the art also, the, the job, the, the, training, the, train, the training is to, the training is, of course, we do fiction. We do something fake, but um, it is, we do also something real. So this is the action. The uh, the vocal action or the physical mm -hmm. action, which is behind the impulse, or which is the result of the impulse. I don't know. The impulse yeah. travels through, like in a real situation yeah. of real engagement. Let's say, no, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, 
Well, you know, interesting and, thing yeah. is that in, in the opera training, you not necessarily learn all these things. I, I was trained in Warsaw and I was trained in New York. What do you mean with these uh, things, all these things? Uh, things? Well, this kind of creating the natural impulse or working with the yeah. bare emotions or with something from your life that can bring uh, the same um, trigger so your body will, you know, react to a... Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can, for example, sing a high note, which will be an expression of joy, as if you were really screaming from joy, for example. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a part of it is that because you have to be in the control of the sound. So you were as an opera singer, you're always balancing on this thin line between always being in charge of producing the sound and kind of changing it if you feel like for example oh now i'm pushing my voice i have to give a little bit less oh now i gave a little bit less but now the sound is not supported so it's airy so i have to you know keep being more present so you're kind of like you're constantly in this being yeah, in, in the and process out. yeah it's a fantastic yeah. you know being an opera singer is like you really are practicing being in now hin und jetzt in now and here <laughs> the whole time because by producing the sound you You have to be in it the whole time. Mm. Once there's, in my case, for example, once I let myself being drowned with the emotions and use this kind of, you know, like, oh, when I sing this song, I will think about, uh, I don't know, my someone I love or something, then I'm actually completely disconnected from the process of sound making. And interestingly enough, I might feel the emotions but they will not come through the music mm -hmm. and my audience will not be moved at all. And in fact, I might be also not singing technically well enough because I've been, I was somewhere else with my imagination, you know, I was, yeah, of course, some other situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that is an important distinction that we were not talking about emotions in the sense that yeah. you should just leave, you know, do what you feel or whatever, no, because this is of course the most The, the biggest trap for anybody on stage. What Absolutely. you feel does not communicate to the spectators. Never. Mm -hmm. No. Or better, it's not sure. You cannot be sure <laughs> that what you feel communicates with. Yeah, it's normally not true. And, but uh, but you yeah. know, it's so it's there's interesting also with the with the image of what you said at the beginning of you thinking of your grandmother. Because yeah, but the, that what is this a, mm -hmm. well, what this image yeah. gives no, you, to me. <laughs> that I would yeah. say, but what this image gives to me, it gives me ease and comfort, mm -hmm. and this feeling like singing doesn't have to be a big effort. Singing doesn't have to be um, a work, you know. And that's that's what makes my body. It's more like an attitude that I go back to. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, so, uh, yeah, athletic voice. What I would be interesting is also interested in is also to talk about the famous vibrato. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is, what is this? Or how do you call it? Vibrato? Vibrato? Vibrato. No, vibrato. Yeah. vibrato. Yeah. And mm -hmm. is it like... Um, how to say where does it come from if you know mm -hmm. it and is it like the non plus ultra of singing or is it just a cliche um, what do you think about it how do you use it and yeah uh, I would I would be interested in uh, for, yeah. for a short moment in this yeah so Again, maybe maybe um, we can say what mm -hmm. is vibrato for a short can you describe? yeah you know I think now you got me because I don't really know how to explain it like scientifically. Um but it's a I can I can say how I feel it as someone listening to the voice with the vibrato. It's the voice that has this little vibration in it. And in the opera, we our goal is to have an even vibration. So I can present you some so the voice goes up and down like la And 
so mm -hmm. on and so on. Yeah. So like the voice feels like it's calm and still and has this, this like even vibration. Um, so you don't make your vibrato like everyone has a has a different timbre and I think vibrato is a part of timbre like technically speaking uh, and a healthy voice and a voice that is well trained so the the muscle core call a uh, collaboration or the muscle balance is on a uh, coordination is on a high level will have this even vibrato in all parts of the voice the voices that are problematic like people who have technical problems you will hear that that for example the high note will have a completely different vibrato or like an uneven one uh, and it can also make the listeners then feel a little bit like that was an unpleasant sound sound for example but now we come to this interesting thing that vibrato is also a cultural concept because uh, for example a hundred years ago People preferred voices that had much faster vibrato than mm -hmm. today. Today, we like voices that are round and warm. And before, they liked voices that were more, what I will describe, for example, pinchy to, pinchy. to our ears. Pinchy, like mm. um, a little bit more like this, uh -huh. right? Uh, and um, Do you mean in the, in the opera, actually? Or you mean in, in the... the opera. In the opera, okay. In the opera, however, in fact, when I listen to old uh, cabaret singers, for example, from the Polish twenties, uh, I see, I feel like lots of them were actually so well trained they could have as well sing opera. Uh, hmm. In that times, they couldn't do it today because they they would not probably like match our expectations yeah. of what beautiful sound is but yeah. back then yeah we should yeah now i know we should you, you do you, you know lotte lenya no absolutely lotte lenya to her yesterday September lotte lenya is she's lotte i made just to explain lotte lenya is the wife of kurt weil who is yeah. of, of course the 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 uh, was the wife of kurt weil who who composed uh, the drei groschen oper and uh, mahagoni for brecht and a, a lot of different kind of music also and she appears in some recordings of also of uh, Mahagoni, which is uh, the only opera by Brecht. Um, and um, you hear her, you, maybe we can listen to her in one moment, because it's mm. so strange. How, how could she fit in this, in this world, in these other singers? She almost sings out of tune, or she sings out of <laughs> tune. I don't know how to describe, but it's so interesting. What you, uh, mm -hmm. you, were, you said you were listening to her. Uh, yeah, I was listening day. to the September song because it's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> yeah, and I also hope that the opera houses will open in September. That's why I just keep singing to myself. <laughs> oh, it's a long, long while from May to December. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very nice. <laughs> the magic but I was, of art. <laughs> I was interrupting you with Lotte Lenya because you were saying um, the 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 styles yeah, I was of saying singing that the and the cabaret singers. Uh, Changed. Yeah, the yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the aesthetic but changed you, from fast mm -hmm. vibratos to more. Yeah, soft, I mean, and... in general, in general, yeah. this is this is a little bit more complicated matter. But I think what changed more is the the color of the voice. That uh, in the beginning, at the beginning of the century, brighter voices were preferred, and now we like to have the voice that are more round and gloomy. Um, mm. And a warm, that's how we call it. It's a, it's a warm, uh, warm sound. Mm. And at the beginning of the century, also people were, um, using the chest and head register in a little bit different way. So it means that the, the chests were really chesty. Like I would say, uh, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, I will sing a little bit of Habanera. Mm. In an old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. mm. That was a little bit exaggerated, yeah. but yeah, that was yeah, like yeah. the old way. And I would say today we try to keep everything super smooth as if it was just like one liquid that is being, you know, coming in a glass up and down. So the contemporary version. Oh, 
apprivoisie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know how it came out through the microphone. <laughs> I'll have to check Good. by myself. No, no. Uh, but um, it's actually a matter of taste. Well, some people say that the old technique was actually better for the voice, that it was much healthier than today. But we have to also remember that so many things have changed. For example, the opera careers. Now the opera singers, are, well, we don't know how it's going to look after the corona crisis. But <laughs> last 20 or 30 years, people were just traveling on and on and yeah. singing many different roles. So being super yeah. busy, singing in very big opera houses before... Opera houses were, there were not so many huge houses like, you know, Metropolitan, this is like 3000 seats. Um, and the thing is that also the repertoire requirements has, has changed a little bit. Back then, people actually were more flexible, just kind of like singing everything. And right now we have like much more strict, um, um, strict, images about how we want a queen of the night sound like you know that a right. dramatische coloratura dramatic coloratura should be someone whose voice is extremely uh present and rich and yet has the extension so she can hit hit the high f for example mm-hmm. um or if you want um so, so that's why like people are more specialized nowadays and mm-hmm. back then it was it was different mm. Uh, I was surprised, for example, to discover because I am myself a mezzo soprano. So this, like, in Mozart time, it was called the second soprano. So a little bit lower than mm-hmm. a soprano, and not an alto. An alto is like a really low voice. This is this is what I'm not. So I'm kind of like this in between uh, creature. Mm. Uh, but because of that, I can actually also sing some of the soprano roles because my high notes are uh, just good and stable. So I took some time last year to experiment with my voice and see what is it actually. And then I discovered I could actually sing super high. I can even hit this high F. So I started thinking maybe this whole um, categories are secondary to the voice, which is natural. And then I started uh, checking on Wikipedia who are the singers who premiered uh, one of the most uh, the important role for the core mezzo soprano repertoire, like for example, Octavian from the Rosenkavalier, um, Componist from Ariadne Alf Naxos, uh, Romeo from Capuletti e Montecchi. And it turned out these people back then, so we are talking like uh, late 19th century, beginning of 20th century, they were singing everything. So the same person hmm. who will sing Octavian will also sing Agate in Freischutz, which is today a typical spinto soprano role so this this used to be much much more flexible and this is where i also decided okay i will just sing whatever feels good to my voice <laughs> i i don't have to like really just fit into these categories and that's i that's where i also met a composer who lives here in colon tomas prasqual and he just started composing for me so now, now this is a really perfect situation because now i have someone who can just uh uh, make uh, like a you know gown that will fit me so like write music mm. that will respond to the flexibility of my voice yeah that's amazing because because you can decide that but of course you're dealing with a very heavily structured and powerful world in which Absolutely. the singer not necessarily is the most the person with the most choices in the matter <laughs> <laughs> Do I put that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a, it is an interesting world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I'm really curious how it's going to change after this uh, Corona crisis. Um, yeah, there is, there is, there is many different elements that come into play here. In a what, one of the things that I'm discovering more and more since last two months is how. Uh, how far away are we from each other in the art world in general mm-hmm. you know the big philharmonies yeah. the opera houses the free scene the little galleries we kind of like never meet you know like even even yeah. the fact that you Simon uh, Simon you said uh, you know so little about the opera 
Uh, so that also shows I, that you know our paths don't cross so much. And I, in fact, uh, I mean, I don't go to the yeah. theater so much <laughs> either. Yeah, so yeah. It's Maybe shameful, it's it's. it's it I mean, I mean, opera was in opera was in was invented somewhere in mm, the absolutely. after in the, in the Renaissance after Renaissance Six, times yes. six, mm -hmm. uh, 1600 no yeah 1573 or it something. was invented <laughs> because people were looking at the old Greek uh, mm -hmm. tragedy Tragedies, yeah. and they were saying this was like a total theater no and we have to recreate mm -hmm. no this is how opera started so it starts with a connection to the Greek theater and um, um, now yeah it's just so uh, I don't. I mean, I, I I I love the singers. I love opera, but I don't know anything about this opera world. No, I never. Mm -hmm. I don't go with a suit into the opera. I don't know. I okay. I don't know if this is. But what this is my imagination, <laughs> of course, of opera. And now maybe a a question from my side. Uh, yeah, may, maybe describe this opera world. Or my question would be, in the in the theater world. In the middle mm -hmm. of the 20th century um, and throughout the 20th century, there were a lot of strange experiments, and uh, also there were there was a lot of I mean, let's make it short. Some kind of independent theater showed up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Independent independent theater, maybe even theater groups or people uh, who decided to do theater in a different way. They started with the, maybe mm -hmm. the scenography, changed the way the spectator is inside of the room, and then they worked on the actor. The actor as a, as a, um, starting with um, uh, Stanislavski and then Grotowski and everybody else, and also in dance, uh, th and in dance, and in dance theater, there was a huge also revolutions coming up changing Absolutely. ballet no yeah. so mm -hmm. is there any like independent opera movement or history or even opera groups is there something like this and if not why yeah i mean i know there are some experimental groups um but of course it's not mainstream so this these groups will almost never you know premiere in the in the in the major opera houses in mm. general, uh, opera houses are playing in 95% the repertoire of the past. It's the same like with phil philharmonies. Although in philharmonies, we will sometimes hear actually more and more new compositions. And the opera houses are still really based on Mozart, Puccini, Verdi, uh, now also Baroque music since, since 20, 30 years. But new composition are not so often being shown normally in an opera house in Germany, maybe one uh, Uraufführung, so the world premiere. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and then never and again. Sometimes yeah. even. And yeah, and most of the time, yeah. Actually, there is only, I don't know, Dr. Atomic, for example, um, by John Adams is an opera who, who did a, a career, so it, uh, it, who had mm. a, who has a car, which has a career, so it means it's, right. it's being, um, it's having new productions. And... Yes, yes, but otherwise. Poor, yeah. really. I, I can't opera really is so think expensive, no? Maybe it's because it's it's, yes. it's such a huge but production that it's hard to be independent and create an opera. <laughs> you, yeah, you, absolutely. You, I mean, we are trying to do that in Cologne. We are having a, a, a group of artists who are all actually coming from free scene, and we are thinking of making a festival. Called, it's called uh, Kölner Musik Theater Initiative. Um, mm. Of course, now everything is hanging in the air, but that would be a place when one could experiment with various forms of musical theater. So yeah. it does. It means it doesn't even have to be an opera. It can be something in between. Um, yeah. Which yeah. But there was like no mainstream revolution, if, if I can just answer your question. So it's not mm. that there was a Marta Graham or, or someone who, you know, uh, came and changed the way we think about opera. Mm. It's still mm. even the modern operas are more or less just, you know, people singing with the orchestra. That's it. But this this is a also, a, I mean, it's a huge question. But then when, when is something opera and when does it start to become like this music theater 
Mm -hmm. It has to do mostly with uh, whether the sound can be projected without a microphone, because in music uh, theater or on Broadway, everyone is using mics because the technique that they are using, which mm. is that there is less vibrato in a voice, uh, makes the voice not travel as far as the operatic voice. Mm -hmm. There is more chest mm -hmm. voice and not so much head voice. And head voice is the what creates vibration and what makes the sound travel. Mm. Uh, so I can also show you an example. Well, let's say I sing maybe this time. I'll be lucky in a more Broadway way. Maybe this time yeah. I'll be lucky. Maybe this time he'll stay. And then the opera, we would sing maybe this time i'll be lucky mm. maybe this time he'll stay of mm. course it doesn't really fit to you know this song but um that would be the difference um yeah so musical theater will be done with the mics and there is also a question of whether there are dialogues or not because if there is an opera with dialogues then it's probably either an operetta or a zingspiel or a zazuela. So these are like this kind of in-between mm. genres. Mm -hmm. May, can we come back for one second? Just I want to ask you, what did you do when you showed this difference? What did you do? Mm -hmm. what, what did you do? I, I don't know what did I do exactly. I can tell you how it feels like. Yes, I mean <laughs> and that's that. how I know which one is which one. So with singing... Um, <laughs> Broadway, I feel that everything in my throat is tighter, but it's not the bed tight. It's not like I feel like I'm, uh, mm. you know, pushing Does and, and making like myself that. miserable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it just feels like there is the, yeah, everything is more compact. And then when I sing with the other, it, there is less sensations in the throat, in fact. Um, The sound feels a little bit more muffy and maybe a little bit more in my head. Mm. Muffy? Um, muffy? Muffy? Is that a word? Muffy? Fluffy, maybe fluffy. <laughs> fluffy, <laughs> fluffy, yeah. Oh, fluffy. Fluffy. Okay. I like the word the, muffy. The fluffy wow. technique. Yeah, great. <laughs> exactly. Um. <laughs> yeah. But that's... Yeah. Uh, That's actually fascinating, the, yeah. Yeah, well, the thing But is with, with that this with this Broadway kind of technique, which, of course, I have to say here, I'm not a Broadway singer, so I don't know if I'm doing it correctly. I just kind of like <laughs> I'm trying to fake it now in order to show you the difference. Mm -hmm. I could not come up with this voice very high. So at some point, I will have to break and then go into the opera singing. Uh, uh, so this is like with Broadway, full. you can... Yes, exactly. With Broadway singers... Of course, there are singers who also who have lower voices and higher voices and higher uh, voices in Broadway sing higher. But still, if they want to hit the super high notes, maybe I can present one. Okay, I guess that was a lot of <laughs> that distortion. That crashed the system, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and the internet went down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whatever Then happened? Then you have to... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's kind of like only possible with this opera voice, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting because when you start into this definition, also like mm, when opera. when you start answering what is opera, then mm -hmm. and then you know it have dialogues and use a certain type of voice and there's no microphones mm. and no uh, otherwise it becomes a zangspiel or Broadway mm -hmm. or and uh, mm -hmm. operetta and mm -hmm. it's yeah. <laughs> It's like these categories, they are so uh, uh, defining actually on Absolutely. things that are not not necessarily an essential part of the artistic uh, uh, content, you know, <laughs> that you mm -hmm. could, because when you have an, an idea or you have like a vision, okay, this thing or this like theme, then you can still choose, will I wrap this in a Broadway <laughs> musical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or... No, I think I'll make an opera. But so these these choices of uh, of genre, it's uh, it's interesting because they, of course, define how we will receive it and how we will also uh, absolutely and who will listen to that, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, uh, most likely because opera also has a very um, uh, what do you say? How we defined audience? No, like. Uh, um, mm -hmm. 
Th yeah. There are people who go to opera and there are people who, who don't. <laughs> Basically, it's not like maybe the cinema that, that probably most of us have been to cinema. And uh, an opera, for many people, uh, opera is something that they would never be interested in approaching. Um, there is, of course, always a lot of talk about it because we feel like we are always this genre that is like, you know, in the danger of ex uh, on extinction, mm -hmm. but that somehow yeah. we, we keep going. Um, there are some theories that opera is something that people might either be exposed to in their young years. So maybe if they are a students or something. And then once they marry and have children that they don't do much cultural <laughs> life because they probably don't have time. <laughs> Watch out, Simon. <laughs> and then um, they come back when they are uh, when they finish working and they they are, you know, um, pensioners. And that's where they have time for culture again and they have time to go to the opera which usually will be then three hours but then you come a little bit earlier to meet your friends or sometimes after the opera you would also go and, and you know have a drink um somewhere so it's like it's it's usually more than just going to the cinema because it's it's it takes more time and you also have to dress up so that's that's another um add up on time <laughs> so the opera is for people who have time and then you also most likely will be re reading critiques the next day uh, so mm -hmm. let's add up and you probably might also uh, want to prepare yourself so you will read the libretto before um, the the opera if you don't remember right. what is Traviata about so there is this you know a whole bunch of rituals around it yeah. um, and a lot of a lot of them are also quite knowledgeable right a lot of people who yeah. enjoy opera, they they also really dive into it. They uh, become Absolutely. kind of a connoisseur. Yeah, there is a, that's, that's also a thing that is really interesting that I don't think any other classical art form has as many, <laughs> excuse me for saying that, but like kind of like psychophants as opera has. <laughs> so people get really, really excited about singers uh, and even it's it's not only about big stars and big names that become celebrities, in fact, mm -hmm. but it's also about the local stars. And it's very beautiful. Like in, in most of the opera houses in Germany where I sang, there is at least like one or two or three or four people that go to the opera twice a week, three times a week. There are even mm -hmm. sometimes people who go almost every day. And uh, they know all the singers personally. They are very, um, you know, vital part of the, the the community in the opera house. Yeah. And they they've been often doing that for years. So they have this this really long lasting relations. They have lived through and experienced many different uh, intendants, so many different opera or artistic directors. So they are mm -hmm. also able to compare different strategies of. Uh, leading the house of inviting, you know, different kind of directors and conductors. Um, so this is one interesting things. But the other interesting thing is is also in uh, on the level of younger people and uh, internet that they are. I heard of that that there are singers that have their hate page. That for example, one singer is very famous, <laughs> but a lot of people think that she shouldn't be so famous because her high notes actually suck and her low notes are not warm enough. <laughs> and they like put all this 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 hate, you know, stuff in there. Just go to YouTube and, and put any actually also famous singer and you will have all mm -hmm. kinds of comments and they're yeah. so passionate. Passionate. The people yeah. who just like sit at home and spend hours yeah. on YouTube comparing different um, yeah, uh, performances and different uh, versions of one uh, aria, for example. I don't think you have it. You might have a little bit of that in the piano world, where, for example, yeah. there is this phenomenon of Chopin <laughs> competition, where people from all over, all over the world, as, and especially from Japan, this is really fascinating, come to Warsaw and they, you know, take part listening to the competition, uh, pre-eliminations, you know, semifinals, finals. Um, so this is this kind of like really, really leidenschaftlich. So this is really, really passionate attitude to the, to this genre. Very uh, participative, very uh, like uh, well, leading to... Well, I'm not sure if participative would be the right word because at the same time, <laughs> they are always 
the one who receives, you know? So for me, opera is also, um, and it's, it's a little bit a pity for me that it's also this, this form that has this really strict division between the makers and the one that receive and clap. And it wasn't always like this, <laughs> a clap or boo, you know, <laughs> you will wish yeah. for clapping. Or tomatoes. Uh, exactly. Because like in Baroque <laughs> times, they used to have the, the chandeliers or the lamps. I don't know what, what was, no, maybe not chandeliers in Baroque times, but the light was on. Um, so the audience was also visible. Mm. And mm -hmm. as you know, you know, people were coming to the theater to play cards, to yeah. be seen yeah, yeah, by yeah, the yeah, other yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was a completely different ritual. Yeah. And right now it's like this, that we who stay on stage, you know, we have our biographies in a program. We have our website. We also very often have our Instagram when people can also see what we ate today and uh, <laughs> what a cute puppy we've been cuddling with. Uh, but the listeners, the audience, they are always anonymous. Um, yeah. and, and I find this, this dynamic actually really interesting. And I feel like there is a lot to discover. Yes, um, I mean, exactly <laughs> this, this strange. Why is it that of all what you talk about is also has been in the theater in the 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th. And of mm -hmm. course, it's, we call it the Italian stage, no? Also, not for mm -hmm. any reason. Also, normal theaters, big theaters, yeah. You have all the same rituals, but there was some moment where, I mean, for instance, Shakespeare's theater, the Globe Theater, everybody was standing. Yeah. Uh, there was, yeah. They were walking around. I, I imagine them eating. I mean, some people mm -hmm. were also sitting maybe on higher ranks, okay? Mm -hmm. But... Uh, and then, of course, through the these reforms or revolutions of the theater makers in the middle of the 20th century, that they started to transform the the, the stage, no, and they started to seat the people in a different way, and mm -hmm. to to make to 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 break these this um, and people and the audience could actually in afterwards maybe be seated in a circle and they could see each other. Absolutely. So, uh, However, I have to say, as far as I know, opera was always having this um, different, like like w you you would pay more money to have better seats. Mm. In fact, I heard of some riots that happened also in the audience because um, they had, for example, um, these cheaper tickets in the galleries that allowed people to come to the theater at the end of the show to hear the finale mm. so think ab about how flexible people were back there now no one will let a you know a late comer in just to hear uh, tosca dying or, or madame butterfly <laughs> it's, know, my part. it's my favorite <laughs> exactly <yeah. laughs> but so they were hearing not only that they were also hearing um uh, an extra piece that was being performed after the Mm -hmm. uh, after the after the opera, the main opera was done. We're talking about 18th century now, and then at some point, uh, the director, the directors of the theater, raised these tickets and said, "Okay, we no longer everyone will have to pay the same price now." And the audience had made a riot, and in fact, force them to leave these tickets. So, so also, you know, people who were not as noble could come and just see the, you know, the last mm -hmm. scene and this extra, the encore, so wow. to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I just I remember something which maybe is interesting. We cannot see it together, but maybe you can. I don't know if you know it. Peter Brook, of course, is one of mm -hmm. these uh, um, theater giants of the 20th century yeah. who started to change everything, among other people. And he directed uh, once at his Théâtre Bouffe du Nord. Actually, I don't know if it was a production of his own theater or if he was, mm -hmm. but they rehearsed in his own, in the theater in Paris. Um, and he did uh, in the 80s or 70s, I don't remember, he did a production of Carmen by Bizet. So uh -huh. he did opera. And there is, uh, you can see it on YouTube, maybe, there is an interesting documentary little documentary and also excerpts from the performance as a kind of a film mm -hmm. uh, where you can see how he works with op with these opera singers and actors in mm. uh, in the same time and mm -hmm. also you can see the performance and he made a very very i find it a very very interesting carmen performance um and mm -hmm. he 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 worked with the opera singers and the actors together and they trained together so they 
Oh, what what does that mean? They made, um, yeah, they made exercises together, no? like mm -hmm. exercises, uh, whatever. They could be very simple exercises that you do uh, to to have a kind of a, um, to have a sense of um, of space and group, no, and other people like training exercises. What you can, what you do for theater, for doing theater, mm -hmm. no. And this oh. is a very interesting to see that. And he did also, Peter Brook, he also did another opera later, which I actually saw the performance. It was the, the Zauberflöte, the magic flute. Mm -hmm. um, he did it with um, a very reduced ensemble um, and only a piano. Mm -hmm. So the whole opera, the magic flute, it was only the piano uh, version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were two or three actors which were mute. And mm -hmm. there were the, the singers, the actors, singers, uh, and a very, very reduced kind of uh, scenography, only bamboo sticks, mm -hmm. no illusion whatsoever, just mm -hmm. little, small, mm -hmm. and it was very, very light and very touching. Um, so it's definitely worth to, 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 to check this out because some kind, there is some connection between, um, or possibilities also for for Absolutely. each. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, mm, the the, the whole also the, the way that we work with the directors it's it's a, it's, it's another very interesting topic because uh, there is also this phenomenon that we usually have one two casts and if someone gets sick uh, for example so we would say we we have a run in a performance run we have 10 shows and five will be sung by one cast and another five by the other cast mm. but then let's say that both toscas are sick so they call the tosca from some other theater and she comes and she jumps in yeah. so that's mean that that means that she has to learn the the staging Sometimes mm -hmm. on a really, really short notice, sometimes she just will be able to watch the video on a plane or uh, on a train and then had a three a quick walkthrough. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it happens in a theater, like in a dramatic theater, right? It would, probably would be really hard to put an, um, to put someone to jump in uh, to the show without being through the process of rehearsing with the, the director and with the entire team. The result, you know, there are funny aspects of that, that, for example, uh, I witnessed um, doing a production when we did a really, you know, deep work with the director and everything was um, really well prepared. But then, yeah, our main soloist got sick and they uh, they called someone else to jump in. And this person came. It was also a very famous singer. And the uh, assisting stage director was, was trying to teach this new singer everything. And this new singer pretend to learn everything. But then he turned to us <laughs> and said, I will just do my own my old thing. Yes, <laughs> you will. So there stick. are also patterns, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, for example, I am uh, quite experienced with the role of Cherubino in Le Nozze di Figaro. And I have jumped in, I don't know, like four times in, in, in different productions. And at mm -hmm. some point, I realize I could probably do this role without any rehearsal because there is always the same pattern that you are in the first act, you are being discovered by the count and you have to hide, uh, hide under the table. And then he, when he comes, he hides under the table and you go around the armchair and then he discovers you, he, he throws you <laughs> on the floor, you pretend to be really scared. <laughs> like there My are so God. many things that You're are so... in the... <laughs> you, this, that sounds like blasphemy to me. <laughs> blasphemy to the holy art of theater. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> no, it's, it's very also quite similar to jazz. No, that, that uh, I have already. This is the second time that I think, oh, that's quite similar to jazz, which is which mm -hmm. is funny in a way. But uh, but yeah. there you have have in a sense, you know, these fixed structures that are that, that are really created to make this interchangeability Work. of the players possible. Yeah, mm. and we yeah. have to remember that in many cases we are. Uh, um, we are singing in the operas that were written before the time the director even existed exactly. in the opera. So these people exactly. in the Mozart times, they were just directing themselves. Yeah, that's um, it. But that's it. And, you know, mm -hmm. Simon, this holy theater, 
this is very much also a director's theater, no, that what you are thinking mm -hmm. of, where mm -hmm. the main genius, creative genius that is actually uh, appreciated is the director. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe it was created by strong directors, but uh, they really, I mean, they really, um, they really influenced or they really made the actor or the actress the center uh, yeah, and the I'm act not sure of the that. center. Yes. I'm not sure. If yes. you think of Odin Theater, the first one you think of is Eugenio Barba. Yes, I know. But if mm -hmm. you, you see the performance, and then in the performance is the is the the actor is the the actress and what they do is um the central uh the central thing and the relation yeah what of you see i mean we, this is an interesting topic though mm. because i really feel that even though this might inside the process and inside this you know it it is true mm. that the credit the creative credit is still very much given to the to the director Mm -hmm. And like the overarching vision is the director, and what yeah, the yeah, actors maybe. are doing is cre yeah. is giving material and giving their uh, their bodies yeah. and their uh, their imaginations. But in the end, Absolutely. the piece is signed by the director. Yeah. Well, the 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 moment for a singer where he could kind of own and claim the entire performance moment is for mm -hmm. example the Liederabend so the evening of song when oh, it's yeah. just the yeah. singer and the pianist and usually you use a very small amount of gesture but because of that everything counts you know and the way you use your face the way you lose your eyes right. the way you might use your hand sometimes it's it's this kind of invisible mm -hmm. directing invisible regie that we make and uh, these are then always our own decision. Uh, and this is a very, very beautiful art. I'm actually really mm. enjoying uh, doing leader. So Abends. true. Mm. Almost like like you are the whole upper, uh, stage in it, in yourself. And it's like this micro Absolutely. Theater. I mean, me and the pianist, of yeah. course. The, but the pianist yeah. usually, you know, plays so he does not uh, make mm. any other gestures than moving the fingers. <laughs> Thank I God. was just <laughs> watching an uh, Indian dancer, uh, actually San Sanjukta Panigrani, this uh, uh -huh. uh, very famous uh, Odyssey uh, dancer. Odyssey, not, not the Odyssey Od by Homer. Not the Odyssey, mm -hmm. not the uh, Odyssey, Odyssey dance by... <laughs> Odyssey dancer. No, no, Odyssey Damn by... In South, it's South, jumping South, a whole South, continent and South some Indian, thousands of years. Okay. South Indian dance form, yes. Odyssey mm -hmm. dancer. Odyssey. And... Uh, uh, and it, this was uh, this was in a sense very uh, what you are saying like the the one artist creating mm -hmm. a huge world by this very minutia uh, of of decisions of of the actors actress herself mm -hmm. and and the rest was also completely black so she was really floating in the middle of the screen and <laughs> it really has this uh, uh, where the where the one very small things became the entire galaxy actually that was created mm -hmm. over there yeah very powerful yeah yeah so what would you Marta what would you yeah. consider as a great performance <laughs> great opera performance yes I mean, not not mm -hmm. and uh, no, yeah, not. I mean not the specific uh, performance. I mean, what is? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know what you mean. You know, for me, uh, the, a performance is great when I feel like I've been watching this opera for the first time. Because there's also this phenomenon that I always know that the Traviata is going to die at the end, right? And so will Tosca and Butterfly and Don Giovanni and everyone. <laughs> But everyone in the, <laughs> a lot of them, but <laughs> if if the if the regie and the weight of of the so the directions and the way of uh, the singers and the orchestra together are creating the magic that makes me feel like I've never heard this story before, and that I feel you know like a child watching this uh series of events and being surprised when the bad things happened at the end i think that's where where for me it's successful and uh and great mm. yeah 
Because otherwise, in every opera, there's just so many elements that you could judge separately. You could judge the bassoon solo in Una Furtiva Lagrima and be so upset about it that it will ruin your <laughs> opera ab- evening, you know? You could judge the first tenor solo from the choir whose line is la cena è pronta so the supper is ready and maybe he was not convincing enough and you might be also upset about that <laughs> uh, you might be upset about the solo dancer in Aida so, so but it's for me it's like yes I, I always I'm you know happy to discuss all these little elements because you know this is my life this is my profession so I like to be analytical and also things to talk with my friends about what I liked, what I didn't. But at the end, it's how the whole story has took me away for this two or three hours, you know. And now changing the perspective, what is for you when you say, um, what is for you, uh, uh, maybe not great performance, but uh, performance that worked? How for me, as a, a, when, I was, yes. when I was singing. Yes. Uh, well, just very simply where I felt like I was in a flow. Um, mm. So I feel I felt effortless, but I also felt the connection with the audience, like, like as, this, as if you had some current between you and them. And it feels like you are able to uh, manipulate the time, you know, by holding a note a little bit, longer and you feel like they're all listening they're watching you Mm -hmm. cooking life cooking your voice life you know i know exactly Uh, what you mean like you have a string right yes string to every yeah yeah so uh yeah i think that's i would like to be to leave these things we could explore about these uh phenomena uh uh hours more but mm-hmm. as I, I as i think the two things that you described um so the perception of the spectator that is this this performance speaks to me as if it was the first time as if it was just mm-hmm. for me no uh, mm-hmm. and for you as the performer to be in this communication in this flow in this current um with the spectator these are two aspects that um, are, of course, a, a big connection between all these performance arts and is the ultimate goal, <laughs> which, how to achieve it, sometimes we mm-hmm. don't know. We have a lot of technique, but sometimes it just happens. Yeah, yeah, the magic comes when it wants sometimes, yeah, as she pleases. <laughs> right. Um, Yeah, I would just, uh, if you have anything to add, uh, I would just love that you maybe, um, I would love to hear the se- this September song, if you would, I, or anything so you that you want. you want to wa- sing it? Yeah, if, uh, anything that you want to just to, to say goodbye to us, I would like to have a goodbye song for today. That would be very nice. Okay. Whatever you uh, want. <laughs> <laughs> And then, then Mariah, sing. do you want to... Oh, I know what I'm going to do. Yeah. Mariah, you want to uh, add but something? I'm looking for the words. Okay, well, yeah. So we wait well, a little I, bit. Well, I would like to end on my usual note, which is... Oh, no. <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I would love to uh, to keep talking with you, Marta, uh, as with all our other guests. And I'm sure we will, mm-hmm. because there's such a huge amount of topics that uh, that we have to talk about with this very specific uh, 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 voice from from the opera and uh, mm-hmm. and I'm sure we will we will have you back in the white room yeah oh I'd love to so Uh, yeah, what I wanted to sing, mm-hmm. uh, because I think somehow it relates to this whole Corona situations, because, you know, we opera singers, we love to be the main divas, the main soloists, but actually singing in a duet or in a quartet or in a bigger ensemble is a fantastic feeling. Mm-hmm. And 
there were moments during the corona when I was singing my favorite melody from Così Fan Tutte from a quartet. And I was singing it by myself and just missing all my colleagues and thinking, where is where am I going to have a Fior di Ligi, a Fernando, a Guglielmo? Yeah. Um, but uh, so you will hear the melody from the main motif from this quartet now. Yeah. And I'm, uh, and I'm dedicating yeah. it to, to all my colleagues that also feel lonely because we cannot uh, mm. sing with each other now. One moment okay. before you start, I will have to say, I will say goodbye to the listeners and to say thank you for listening to the podcast. And um, I repeat that you should uh, actually subscribe to it. And it's even better to do it with an app or with iTunes or on any other podcast, uh, whatever, directory or application, because then you will get also this episode and the next one and it will be more, yeah, we can reach you easier and you can reach the new episodes more easier. And uh, as we are building up this, th this stock, this archive of this living book, as we said at one moment, no? Of, 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 of experiences, of technique, of maybe methods or non-methods or anti-methods uh, or methods <laughs> against methods um, that we can enjoy <laughs> afterwards uh, in, in, in listening to. And maybe you also are surprised at hearing if you maybe listen to this episode because you know Marta and uh, then if you subscribe, then maybe you will listen to the next episode with a, uh, with a totally different artist that you never heard of before and so consider that and uh, if you have a spare euro you can also support the podcast via paypal or a bank all the information is on the website and we'd love to also have comments at uh, for instance via email white room at white room pod.com but it's also on the website so with this I want to say goodbye to you and we will listen to Marta who has the last word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think I could imagine your colleagues over there. Yeah. <laughs> You're longing for them as we are longing mm -hmm. for our yeah. colleagues. See you soon then. <laughs> See you soon. All right. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Ciao. ciao.